Hello everybody. In today's video we're going to be talking about two of the grindability tests that are commonly used to size grinding mills. We're going to be looking at the SMC test and the Bond Rod Mill Work Index test. So the problem statement, why do these tests exist? Because we as designers need to be able to measure the specific energy consumption needed to reduce a particular ore from a feed size to a product size. And the way to do that is to go into a laboratory and make some sort of a measurement of the energy needed to break rocks. So we'll be looking at how these two metrics are similar and how they're different and how you can use them to come up with a, a good, robust mill design for your project. So the grindability uh, models that we use to do mill sizing generally fall into a couple of categories. The first category are the bond type models and the second category are the, the Morel or MI type models. So the bond type models are generally based on the work index tests that are done in laboratory and at the fine size class you've got the ball mill work index test, you've got an intermediate size that is represented by the rod mill work index test and you've got the coarse product size, coarse feed size represented by the crushing work index test. Now in the MI based modeling you have an SMC test which gives you the coarse and to a lesser extent the intermediate sizes and you use an MIB value which is derived from the bond ball mill work index test you use that um, to represent the fine size classes. So this video we're specifically looking at these two tests we're looking at the intermediate size class for the bond series the rod mill work index and we're looking at the SMC test which includes MIA values and DWI values and MIC values. Another way of viewing that is, is with this ruler where you can see the bond tests are up on the top of the ruler and a bunch of other tests are down below. Each of these lines on the ruler represents the approximate feed size as an F80 that goes into a particular laboratory test and the approximate product size is a P80 that comes out of the laboratory test. <clears throat> Above the, the ruler you can see the bond tests where the crushing work index test on the right it's fed particles of about 50 to 75 millimeters and the product that comes out of it is going to be something on the order of 20 to 30 millimeters. The rod mill work index you feed it something of about 12 and a half millimeters and it comes out around about one millimeter. Ball mill test you start at about three millimeters you go down to whatever product size you need it to go down to. The SMC test you can see is just below the, the ruler and it really overlaps with the rod mill work index test. So I have an expectation as a, as a modeler that these two tests should be measuring much the same uh, grindability met metrics. It should be giving you a very similar result in the two different tests. And here's what I would expect to see. So the, the colored points here are from the, uh, the published public grindability database. And you can see that by and large, the rod mill work index, which is plotted on the vertical axis, does match the DWI value from the SMC test, which is plotted on the horizontal axis. Now, the different colors you see here, the red represents mostly Australian projects. You can see they're in a slightly different part of the calibration space. And the green projects are mostly South American and North American. They're in a slightly different part of this space. We'll talk to you about how you can use that as a quality control metric a little later on in the video. So the apparatus that are used in these tests, you can see on the left side is a, a bond rod mill apparatus, um, thanks to ALS Metallurgy and Kamloops for these photos. You can see it has a wave liner on the inside. On the right hand side, you can see the, uh, the JK drop weight test rig, which is the big blue machine that's at the back of the photo up against the wall. That's the apparatus that's used when you're running the SMC test. So the bond apparatus has a wave liner as we saw in the, in the picture. The, the mill has to be rocked back and forth as the test is progressing because the rods will not fit snugly inside this, the interior of the mill. And so there's empty space between the end of the rod and the end of the mill where coarse particles can build up. And that rocking mechanism brings those coarse particles back inside the rod charge and makes sure that everything gets ground evenly. If you don't rock the, the rod mill, you end up with a whole bunch of coarse material that never gets ground, and that's gonna throw off your work index result. The bond test is also a closed cycle test. We'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, and it is run to equilibrium. 
Now, be aware that there are non-standard rod mill work index apparatus out there, particularly in Australia. The JK Tech Lab in Australia has the correct geometry for a bond rod mill. Other, mill, other labs in Australia do not have the correct apparatus. And you can see that in these pictures where the one on the left has the proper wave liner, the one on the right has a smooth liner. The one on the right will not give you a bond rod mill work index. It gives you a rod mill work index, but it's not something that I can use because all of my models are calibrated to the bond type. There are other consultants that have models that are calibrated to these non-standard devices. So again, if your consultant wants the non-standard test, they have a reason for wanting it, and that's what their model is calibrated to. In my situation, I'm only interested in the bond type with the wave liner where the, the rod mill gets rocked every 10 revolutions. So the SMC test, we described it uses the JK drop weight test rig. It generates a whole herd of grindability numbers. Uh, you basically measure one underlying grindability metric, and then out of that you extrapolate all these other numbers. So the DWI, the MIA, the MIC, the MIH, the A, the B, the A times B, and the TA are all derived from one measurement, which then just gets extrapolated in a bunch of directions. The SMC test does give you a density. They do a, a water displacement density before running the test. So that's useful. That's a second measurement that you get out of the test for free. You get the ore hardness, and it comes out calibrated in a bunch of different ways, depending whether you're doing an HPGR, which is an MIH, a tumbling mill, which is an MIA, or a crusher, which is an MIC. So the feed that goes into the SMC test kind of dictates the size class where it's actually applicable, where it's actually making a measurement. So the feed that goes in is normally about 26 millimeters to 31 millimeters. When you do the test, everything finer than that lower size class, the 26 millimeter, that gets discarded. That's not actually included in the tests. The coarse parameter, the MIC, you might use that to size primary crushers, which have a feed of, let's say, 150 millimeters. The 150 millimeter size class does not appear in the SMC test. So you're doing an extrapolation from that 30 odd millimeter size range up to 150. And you have to hope that that extrapolation is valid for your ore because those extrapolations are always ore specific. The SMC test is specimen based. We'll talk more about that in the next slide. So feed preparation. Feed preparation to the rod mill work index test is you start with about 14 kilograms of material. You crush it down to 100% passing 12 and a half millimeters. You then riffle split and mix, riffle split and mix, riffle split and mix down to you get to a mill charge, which is about one and a quarter liters. And then every subsample you take below that, again, you keep riffle splitting and riffle splitting. So every subsample that you have all the way down this chain should be a representative sample. The SMC test, the feed preparation is you crush everything down, um, passing 31 millimeters. And then you take everything below 26 millimeters, 26 and a half millimeters, and you discard that. So you're left with just this narrow size range. Out of that narrow size range, the test operator will choose the individual specimens that go into the apparatus. You don't test every one of the specimens that are available. You only select a certain number of them. And that selection can bias the result if the operator is not choosing them in a way that represents the population. So that's a potential source of bias just by, caused by selecting these specimens. So the operation of the test now, the bond rod mill test, you load up the mill with your one and a quarter liters of material. You run it for some number of cycles, could be 50, could be 100. And then at the end of that set of cycles, you empty the contents of the mill and you screen out at whatever the determined uh, screen size is, usually about 1.1 millimeter. And every, you measure the amount of material that passes that product screen. So the amount of material passes that product screen, you note that down on the log. You replace the, the mill charge that is coarse. The coarse mill charge goes back in the mill. The fines, you set them aside. But you need to now bring the mill charge back up to its original weight. So you go back to your feed sample and you're gonna add enough feed to bring the, the mill charge back up to its original weight. Then you close the mill up, run it for a few more cycles. Again, the equations will tell you if it's 50, if it's 75, whatever the number is. You stop the test, you open up the mill, you empty the contents, 
screen it again, weigh again how much material is produced in that number of cycles, take the oversize, put it back in the mill, put fresh feed back in the mill, run it again, keep going, and you keep going with this until it reaches an equilibrium where the number of grams of product that are generated by each revolution of the mill is equal from uh, one iteration to the next iteration. That's when you've, you've reached steady state, and at that point you can stop the test. The SMC test is different. You're, 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 uh, you're impacting one particle at a time, so there's no, nothing reaching equilibrium here. It's just a matter of taking your 30 to 40 specimens, putting them in the machine, whacking them, pulling them out, screening them to figure out how much of the material of the product is one-tenth of the original size, and then you just mark that down, put the next specimen in, and hit it, and, uh, and you keep repeating until you've, you've used up all your specimens. So the, the result that you get out of the test, in the Rod Millwork Index test, the equation that you use to turn the laboratory results into a work index is published. So five minutes after you finish screening the sample, you can have your rod mill work index, right? There, there's no black boxes involved. The equations are all published. You generate that yourself. The SMC test, the laboratory has to send off raw results to Australia along with a license fee. And then they get back this, this herd of different grindability metrics, which are all calibrated to slightly different things. The actual calculation that goes on in Australia is a black box. Some of us have a pretty good idea what's in that black box, but for your purposes, the lab sends the raw results and then you get back results. At the high level then, the bond test is open, which is good, and it means you can generate your own results very quickly, but it also means that there's no governing authority. Just because somebody has a bond rod mill doesn't mean that it's been validated by any authority to say that it's giving you the correct numbers. The SMC test, by virtue of being a closed test, and having a licensing authority means that that licensing authority does do round robin tests to confirm that any particular drop weight rig anywhere in the world should generate results equivalent to any other drop weight rig anywhere else in the world on the same specimens. So you do get that extra benefit of having the licensing authority versus the, uh, the bond test which is completely open. At a high level too, if you want to be kind of snarky, you can see that the rod mill work index test is a tumbling test, which represents what you would see in an industrial sag mill. And the impact mechanism you see in the SMC test, well that would be really appropriate for sizing stamp mills. So further comparison, the rod mill work index test, it basically takes all day to run one of these tests. It takes a long time to run. The SMC test, it takes hours, it won't take all day, but it's still, it, it's not something that's a particularly rapid test. But you will finish more SMC tests in a time period than you will uh, a bond rod mill work index test. So outputs of the rod mill work index test include the work index, which you calculated as we saw in the previous slide. But you also get particle size distributions of the feed and of the product that come out of the test. Ordinarily, you're only going to read the 80% value off of these particle size distributions, but you'll see in the next slide, you can actually get more out of it than just the 80% passing sizes. The SMC test, it gives you a whole bunch of grindability metrics that are calibrated to particular types of equipment, which is useful, and you also get this density measurement for free, so that's useful as well. So the rod mill work index test, if you look at the particle size distributions measured from the feed and the product, occasionally, um, Experienced operators like me can look at these particle size distributions and see things. My expectation is that these particle size distributions should match a Godin Schumann regression curve. And on the diagrams you see on the slide, the green lines are the Godin Schumann distribution. The distribution on the left fits the Godin Schumann distribution. So to me, that's a normal distribution. I have no issues with that test. The test on the right, you can see that the particle size distribution deviates from the Gordon schumann regression at about 10 millimeters. Now that can mean a couple of things. It could mean there's an error in, in the laboratory technique. Usually though, what that actually represents is not an error in the laboratory, it's actually an ore characteristic. Your ore might have a texture that manifests at that 10 millimeter size range, where you might be going from, let's say, pulling apart brecciated particles to now breaking the matrix of the rock as you as you've break, pulled off that last brecciated particle and you're moving finer and finer you're now doing a different mechanism of breakage 
that's one of the things that you could see in this, you can infer from this when you see these sorts of, of inflection points in the particle size distribution curves. You get this in a rod mill work index, but you do not get this ability in an SMC test. So further comparison here, the rod mill work index test, you get some useful extra data in terms of these um, particle size distributions. You also get a, a tendency for the tumbling test, the rod mill test, to match other tumbling tests like the ball mill work index test. You'll see in a future slide here what I mean by that. The SMC test is, it's actually simpler for inexperienced users to operate because the results are already calibrated for particular equipment. You got your MIA value for the tumbling mills, MIH values for the HPGRs, MIC value for the crushers. It's already done for you. The issue with the SMC test is it can be noisy for heterogeneous ores. And part of that comes down to this issue of choosing specimens, depending whether you choose the green balls or the blue balls or the red balls, you'll get different results depending on which combinations of colors you end up with actually in the machine, because the machine is not fed a representative sample unless you make it so. So what do I mean by noisy? Here's what the rod mill work index for a particular project looks like, plotted against the rod mill work index on the vertical line, the ball mill work index on the horizontal line. And you can see that there's a relatively narrow band that the rod mill work index fits in, where you get about plus or minus 10% variation in the rod mill work index versus the ball mill work index. The gray points you see in the background, that's my overall database. And you can see that they were slightly offset to the, to the top end on this particular ore body. And again, that's a useful thing to know that this is slightly harder in that intermediate size class than what we would see in other typical ores. Now the equivalent in the SMC test, and I'm looking here at the DWI value, you get much more scatter, much, much, much more scatter. Uh, this particular project has a very bimodal ore breakage characteristic, and that can confuse the SMC test, in my opinion, which is why you see this plus or minus 30% spread on the work in, on the DWI for a given ball mill work index. This is the same project as the rod mill work index was done on. These are the same specimens that the rod mill work index was done on. So this is, this is an example of a project where I would claim that the rod mill work index works better to characterize the ore than the SMC test does. So having said that, which test should you use when you're setting up your own grindability programs for your project? The answer is use both. There are consultants out there that use one technique or the other technique or both techniques. Choose one of these two techniques as your primary method for sizing your mills. You're going to have a particular consultant working on the job who's going to have a particular set of, of equations and models used for mill sizing. That'll become your primary method, whichever, tech, whichever test your consultant says to use but use the other one as a backup to the first. You can use it as a quality control check. I'll show you that just in a moment. The quality control check secondary uh, test, you don't have to do that on all of the samples. You can do it on a subset of them. So let's say you choose the SMC test as your primary method. Then on every second or on every third specimen, do a rod mill work index test, and that'll become your quality control check. Did the SMC test give you the result that it should have? And this is what that looks like when you do that quality control check. So on this diagram, you've got the rod mill work index on the vertical, and you've got the DWI on the horizontal. You've got the cloud of, of all projects in the gray points, and you can see the, the, the yellow diamonds are this project sitting nice and neat in the middle of the cloud of data. You've got a nice correspondence where the hard rod mill work index lines up with the hard DWI soft rod mill work index is a soft DWI. This is a quality control check that has worked. Right? This particular ore, this is not the ore we saw earlier, this is a different ore. This ore works really well in both tests and gives you a, a good corroboration whether you use the SMC test or the rod mill work index test as your primary or secondary method, you should get them the same mill sizes. So the conclusions. Each test measures a slightly different mechanism of breakage, but they should both be useful and they should both be correlated in a way that your consultants know what to do with. 
The SMC test can be noisier on heterogeneous ores. One of the reasons I like the rod mill test more than the SMC test is that it, it actually blends things better and you end up with a mill charge that better represents the mill charge you see in a tumbling mill. The rod mill work index and the SMC test, they can be quality control checks for each other. That's why I suggest you're always collecting both of them on the same projects. The rod mill PSDs, particle size distributions, those can be useful to help diagnose what's going on when ores are misbehaving. If you've got an ore where the rod mill work index and the SMC test don't match, start diving down into the particle size distributions and see if there's any weird kinks in the size distributions. But when you're doing bond type equations, only use bond type laboratory apparatus. You wanna use the bond rod mill work index with the wave liner and that gets tilted every 10 revolutions. And I'll just leave you with a teaser here. There are new apparatus out there in the industry that generate um, new types of laboratory metrics which can be used for mill sizing and for geometallurgy. These new equipment have some features that don't exist in the legacy tests. But I'm going to have to address that in a future video, so make sure you're subscribed to the channel and then you'll pick up this video when it comes out where I can talk about the, the extra features of these new tests and what that can do for you when you're doing your mill designs. With that, I'll sign off and say bye for now and I'll see you in the next video.